Today's scripture reading is in God's Word is in Acts 2, 36 through 39. <clears throat> Therefore, let us all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So be it. I don't think a moment, am I? Okay, I got a red light on the battery though. Should we go ahead and change it? Before we get going? I don't think I'll make it. town again. Am I on? Okay. Yes. You're right. All right, let's start with prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. We know that you're in control of all things, Lord, and we pray for safety for our family, for our friends, for this church, Lord. We pray for this country and the, the division that's in this country, Lord, and the uncertainty of the times and everything else. And Lord, we pray that we know what's going on and we're not uninformed but yet we take what we hear with a grain of salt and just trust in you not to worry about where we're going to get our next meal from or what we're going to wear or anything else but just know that you are sovereign you have a plan and that if we are the hands and feet of Jesus that we are going to be ushering his return in we just thank you and praise you for all that you do for your goodness for your mercy your long suffering your grace and so much more for you are so worthy Lord, let, open our ears to hear, Lord, and be obedient to the things that you teach us. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I am going to go back to Acts, and we're going to get to Acts chapter 3 today. And I struggled with the title of this. Um, I called it Dress to Serve. But I also was thinking about wearing the proper clothes, because we're clothed with power. Uh, I also thought, I thought about it being dressed to serve, and you'll understand this as we get into the message even further. Dressed to serve even a professional bum. You're like, what does that mean? Well, just think about this for a second, and you'll understand this more as we go along. How many times have you and I walked by that particular person, especially that professional bum that's holding up the sign that says whatever he says, and you thought a thought in your heart, well, if that guy would just get a job, or if he'd get rid of that two dogs that's beside of him, or whatever reason. But I want to say shame on me. I say that instead of shame on you. Did I say that? <laughs> that we think that way. Because grace, grace, grace has nothing to do with what we deserve. We all deserve for the wages of our sins eternal death and separation from God. And Jesus gave up heaven... He didn't have anything on this earth. 
And we are to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to be like Jesus, little Christ in this world. So I had Merle read from Acts chapter 2 so we can look back and think about what happened at Pentecost. And I want to do a little bit of reviewing first before we get to Acts chapter 3. Because we've looked at the coming of the, the Holy Spirit, the promise that was there in Scripture, the power and everything. We saw Peter's sermon, which was the Holy Spirit's sermon. Don't forget that. That's the first sermon given by someone in the New Testament after the coming of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit's words through Peter. Very different than he was when he was denying Christ not many days before that. And the Holy Spirit came in power. There was a miracle. The miracle that happened came upon all the believers. They all spoke in tongues. Sons, daughters, even servants. We saw that from uh, his use of Joel's scriptures and everything. We also saw from reading Acts that, the, that each of them talked that way. And this miracle brought about this opportunity to tell others about Jesus. In the first case, it was people who were God-fearing already that came to Jerusalem because they wanted to know more. And we have a spike that 3,000 were saved. You're not going to see the spike after this because the Holy Spirit came at that point in time to God-fearing people and after that, it's going to get a little harder to fish that way, isn't it? Sometimes I think about that. You know, you go to church and you talk to your family and your friends about Jesus all the time, but you're not really catching that many men, are you? Well, it's not your job to catch. Jesus said He would make you fishers of men. You just have to come after Him and follow Him. So the problem might be that you haven't forsaken all and come and follow after Jesus, but the catching's not up to you anyway. And then you hear stories of these people going off to foreign countries and stuff, really catching fish. Doesn't that sound good for people that like fishing? It's, I like catching. She enjoys fishing okay. She can do it all day. But if I haven't caught nothing in an hour or so, I'm ready to do something else. And that's as short as I'm. But that's not what we're called to be as fishers of men. We are called to fish, fish, fish. And then there will be probably some catching along the way. You might not even find that you caught any until you get to heaven. But we are called to fish for men, to be like Jesus, to not worry about the things of this world. And then the Holy Spirit, not Peter's words, but the Holy Spirit convicted their hearts and God added to their numbers. And at the end of that chapter... We, we see what the church looks like. The fact that before they had been meeting together, they had been praying together, they had been sharing things, but they lived in fear. We don't want to live in fear. There's so many things that make people live in fear today in this country. We don't know what tomorrow is going to hold. Are we going to become a communist nation? Everything else. What in the world is going to happen? Are our rights going to be taken away? Don't worry about it. Be Jesus' hands and feet in this world. And if those things are happening, even more of a reason for us to be Jesus' hands and feet in this world. And when the opportunity comes, we preach Jesus and we let the Holy Spirit convict men. The birth of the church comes. But that Acts 2 church looks a lot different than the church looks in this country today. If you can't see that, keep reading it. Keep studying it. And I want to remind you of a few things that Jesus said. In Matthew 28, when they saw him, they worshiped him, verse 17, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We call that our great commission. So is it your great commission? You know the great commandment too because Jesus has already summed up and said all the laws of the prophets hangs on these two commands to love the Lord your God with everything and to love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus taught many other things about who our neighbor is. And yes, it includes everyone, even that bum on the corner that I have walked by and turned my nose up at. Reminds me of that story of the Good Samaritan. How am I acting? Am I that religious leader that walked by on the other side? How am I living my life? And how can I expect the Holy Spirit to be giving me power to be doing His job if I am the one hindering Him because I'm not listening to His call? And again, we'll see that in Acts chapter 3 because this blind beggar, well not blind, this beggar, um, is healed. 
What if Peter walked by him that day? Luke 24, verse 45, Then he opened their minds so they could understand the Scriptures. He told them that this is written, The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead. On the third day, repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in His name to all nations. Nothing has changed there. The mission is still the same. To train up disciples, to teach them about Jesus Christ, that we will preach repentance for the forgiveness of sin to all nations. Verse 48, you are my witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Clothed with power from on high to what? To do what Jesus told you to do. To live a life of obedience, to proclaim His love, God's favor, until He returns. Nothing has changed from the church. If you drop down to verse 52, then they worshipped him, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple praising God. But like I told you, there was still fear, and there was the authority given to them for this mission, but not the power for this mission. And then in Acts chapter 1, it starts out, that's Luke's continuation, as Paul he said, to, to his uh, gospel account. In my first book, Theopolis, I wrote to you about all the things that Jesus began to do and teach. So I have to stop and say, well, what did Jesus do and teach? Because I am the one, you are the one, the church is the one that is going to continue doing the things that he taught, the things that he did. And then we have that scripture that says greater things that even will do. How does that come into play? Verse 3, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. I know many of you, I know myself, said, well, what what, would I say to this person? You know, I got it on my heart that I want to go talk to them, but what would I say? Jesus is alive. (laughs) That's what they preached, that Jesus Christ is the only one who has ever professed to be of God, be God. He's the only one that there's an empty tomb. No other religious leader, religious prophet, miracle worker, anything else can, you can go say, hey, that guy's not in his tomb anymore. But Jesus rose from the dead just as Scripture said. So that makes me want to read Scripture, study Scripture to see. Because Jesus is the one. He is the way, the truth, and life. I can count on everything that He said. And He told me that I have a job to do until He returns. That I should get rid of everything else. And so do Paul and Peter tell me that also. So that nothing hinders me so that I can do his job until he returns for me. And why would I not want to do that? Because if God loves me that much, why would I not want to give my life up for him? And as we taught in uh, VBS, that if I give up the treasures of this earth, I'm going to be building purse strings that never fail in heaven. So why would I let anything hinder me? from living the life that Jesus has given me authority and then power to do. He's alive, and He appeared to them over 40 days and spoke to them about what? The kingdom of God again. It's about kings and kingdoms. You know, it really doesn't matter who's the president of the United States. I'm sorry to say that. God is in control, and He works good for all, to all those who love Him. It might not seem like it at this time. And if you look at the church, they were persecuted. We're going to get there after this. And they were persecuted, and they prayed for boldness. I don't know what's going to happen this school year. I don't know if we're going to shut down a wand or anything else again as it, it gets started, but I'm going to put myself to prayer, and I'm going to be ready and trust God no matter what happens, regardless of any pandemic or any government restrictions or anything else. But yes, we'll have to you know, abide by that some way. I'm not saying be a crazy religious person. I'm saying love Jesus. Does that make sense? Okay. On one occasion, verse 4, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised which you have heard me speak about. Very clear here, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They understand kings and kingdoms and 
and your allegiance to them. But they don't want to pledge their allegiance to Caesar. They want to get their country back, their power back. But it's not about the kingdom of Israel. Even though David was given the promise that one of his descendants would reign eternally, that will happen. It's about the kingdom of heaven. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. Change the way you think so it changes the way you act so your heart is focused on doing things for the kingdom and you actually have the authority and the power to present the gospel message which will grow the kingdom until Jesus Christ returns. Think about that a second. That is the greatest mission ever that we are a part of that is just wow. And it's not even you having to do it. It's the Holy Spirit doing it through you if you'll just be obedient. He'll give you the words to even say. He'll even pray for you when you don't know what to pray for. What a promise. But here's Jesus' reply. Verse 7, It is not for you to know the times or dates that the Father has set by His own authority, but you will receive that power that I promised you about when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Not that you won't suffer, not that you'll have the peace that surpasses all understanding. There, there are ver verses for the peace and everything else. But that you will be my witnesses, which I've told you before that word could be translated martyrs. That you will speak up for me and what I've done for you no matter what the cost. And if you come and follow after me and forsake the world, I'll make you fishers of men. Fishermen eventually catch don't you want to catch your children, your grandchildren, your friends, even your enemies, even that professional bum on the side of the road? Don't get me wrong when I say this. There's no animosity there or anything. I'm trying to build that picture because we've all, I think we have, I have, have drove by that person and said, get a job. That's what you need. No, get Jesus. That's really the answer. But how can we portray that and say that if our heart is not changed. That Samaritan would have never helped that Jew, that, that Judean, if he didn't just have compassion, even for his enemy. His compassion is what compelled him to help that man because that man needed his help. Oh, the guy on the street doesn't need my help? Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. It's not up to you to say it's up to you to listen to the Holy Spirit. Okay? And we'll get to chapter 3 in just a minute. You will be my witnesses. If you continue to read on in Acts chapter 1, you get down to verse 12 through 14. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer. Well, that's one thing I think I see that the church is not doing right off if I wanted to start picking at the things we're not doing today. Are we constantly joined? I didn't say constantly in prayer. I said constantly joined together in prayer. Along with the women and, the, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers... We drop down to verse 23 and through 25. So they nominated two men because they know the mission. Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed. We see prayer again. Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostol apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lots fell to Matthias. So he, so he was added to the 11 apostles. You know, I, I always find this kind of strange, but I don't find it strange why Luke wrote this. Because what does this got to do with the rest of the story? It's got everything to do with it. Because if you realize, they realized that 12 of them were called. They needed to fill this position. They wanted somebody from the beginning. And if you notice how they did it, they did it constantly in prayer, constantly in prayer. And then they prayed specifically for this 12th person. And they cast lots. That's not anything crazy or anything else. It's how they finally, after enough praying, said, it's time for us to make a decision and we're going to cast this lot and trust that God answers us through this lot. You know, you won't find that in the rest of the New Testament. 
because you don't need lots anymore. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You just need to listen to the Holy Spirit. Then we have chapter 2. We have the miracle that comes, all of them speaking in tongues, the opportunity to preach, not a uh, planned out sermon, but the words given to Peter because he's obedient and his heart has changed. And of all people, Peter is the one that's a prime example of change. The power and words of the Holy Spirit, men convicted, and the birth of the church that we call. The church has already started because we had 120 before that. But the birth of the church, and they acted and lived differently. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 40, after Peter gave the words from the prophet Joel and from the prophet David, he said this in verse 40. Well, he didn't say this. It's the, perscript, the transcript of it. With many other words, he warned them. We don't know what those words are. And he pleaded with them. He begged. And he said, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Because if you just accept Jesus, but you continue to live in fear of this world by the authority and powers of this world, by the desires of this world, then you're going to miss out. You're going to miss out on the joy. You're going to miss out on catching some of the fish. And this is exactly what could have happened to Peter. But instead, that day, those who accepted the message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Please continue to read Acts 2, 42 to 47. Think about it. Pray about it. They devoted themselves. That's a step up from where they were before. And this is all of them. There's no implication that this was not all of them that did that. Well, yeah, we get Ananias and Sapphira in a little bit, but as a whole... The church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to prayer. As a result, everyone was filled at all with the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Do you remember when Jesus said, I would have performed more miracles here if you'd have just believed? But the people believed and many miracles were happening. We don't know what these miracles were yet. Okay, Verse 44, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They even sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. That would be that professional bum over there too, would it not? Or did they go pull him out and say, you really don't have a need. We're the judge and jury for you. Or did they let God handle that? Did they have the right heart? Something to think about. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Glad and sincere hearts that I'm being persecuted, that I've sold everything that I have, that I gave up my job, whatever it was, to be a fisher of men. And I'm glad and I'm sincere about it in the depths of my heart. <clears throat> Verse 47, praising God and enjoying the favor of the people. Their needs, needs were met by one another. You know, one of the things that I love from this wonderful church is when I get a knock on my door occasionally, and I get some green beans from Barbara Doug. I'm like, I am so loved. <laughs> what a little thing. But my needs are taken care of, and they really are. All of our needs can be filled by one another in this church. There's no reason that, that when anything happens to anybody that we can't fill each other's needs. And then talk about the gifts and the and the power that the Holy Spirit gives us, and the prayer and the unity that we have for one another, for the mission of ushering in the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Is that sincerely how you feel? They enjoyed the favor of the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That was the result, catching fish. Okay, so we've got the birth of the church, we've got authority, we've got power, and we've got people who live differently in this world no matter what the cost. Then we've got Acts chapter 3. I'll read through it and then I'll go back and talk about it. <clears throat> One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he, was, where he was put every day to beg for those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. 
Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with, with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the palace called Solomon's Colonnade. Now, there's the miracle. Okay? And remember that Luke writes, as a physician, he wrote very, writes very precisely. You see that in his gospel. He's still writing the same way here. So this isn't a random or haphazard story. There's so much here. Okay? <clears throat> verse 12, you've got a change of events from the one day that verse 1 started. When Peter saw this, <laughs> he sees sermon opportunity. Okay? When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. He handed him over to be you handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him as you can all see. And highlight verse 16. Go back and study it. It's a wonderful verse. Verse 17, Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that the time of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who, he has, who has been anointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago, through the holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people, and you must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from his people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, Through your offspring all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to, to you to bless you by turning each of you from his own wicked ways. Now, if you ever wonder what passage to tell someone about that's, that's interested, that says, hey, why do you believe in Jesus? Right there it is. It sums it up. Or Stephen's, as we see, will, that'll be coming up, will tell you exactly what it is because they'll have, they have all these questions. Well, why would God do this or do that? Right here it is. This is all appointed in His plan. And praise God that He is still doing His plan, that He won't change in spite of, despite you and I and all the wicked things that we do. We even killed the author of life. But He said that was His plan because I plan on giving the gospel message reconciliation to all men that all might be saved. And then you just let these words convict that person's heart or not. But you, when you get the opportunity, you do just like Peter did, and you present this message. Jesus. Jesus. And He is alive. He died for your sins, but He is alive now. He will return. It's up to you to decide that or not. So in chapter 2, we saw the promise. We saw the people praying, but there was fear. We saw the power come, the miracle that happened among all of them. Crazy. And at just the right time, that they all started speaking in tongues because we've seen unity come back rather than division over divided tongues. There will be a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And the, the language barrier was brought down that day and people had to decide whether the message would convict their hearts or not. And 3,000 of them said, yeah, it convicts our heart. And they lived differently. So then we get to chapter 3. And it starts out with one day. Okay? How long a time period do we have? Don't know. 
But we had enough time period that we had 40 days and Jesus ascended, 50 days the Holy Spirit comes, and enough time that they sold property and they had everything in common. So this is not day 50, day 51. Some commentaries will say it is, but read it carefully. There's a time period that's happening here when people sell their goods, gather together continually in prayer. Many wonders and, and all things of all have come along and we're staying focused on our mission and we know as we read ahead that there's persecution and, and, and fears and everything, but we continue on with our mission because this is what we're supposed to do because we're ushering in the kingdom of God and one day soon Jesus will return. And then one day, day 327... I'm making that up, okay? One day, Peter and John are walking to the temple at the time of prayer, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I don't know if you know what happens before the time of prayer, but it's the time of sacrifice. <laughs> they didn't go to that. They didn't need to. Because Jesus, all this points to the sacrifice that comes through Jesus, our Passover lamb. Jesus has come. The sacrifice has been made. There is no penalty of sin. No sting of death if you believe in Jesus. But they went to for the time of prayer, didn't they? <clears throat> and now, a man who was lame from birth. Birth. He never had the ability to walk. He never knew what that was. You take a newborn baby and you lay a newborn baby down. He said, get up, walk. Run. It doesn't happen. It happens with development and time and they wobble first and everything else. Look at the miracle that happens here. He was lame from birth. He was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful. Don't worry about what gate it is. We don't know. <laughs> so many speculations, but this miracle is beautiful. Beautiful that Peter was so dependent on the Spirit that he could have realized all of this because the Spirit had to say to him, this man is here. Tell him to get up and walk, and this miracle is going to happen. It's not going to not happen. Okay? <clears throat> where he was put every day to beg. Wait a minute. He's been lame from birth. He's put there every day to beg. I would call that a professional beggar. Okay? And I'm going to give you more that he's a professional beggar because he expected money. That's what you expect from this world. I'm not going to be healed, but hey, if you'll give me money, I can at least support myself. But Jesus is teaching, he said, don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear. And he wants to give you so much more than those things. And he wants you to build up treasure in heaven. Well, how can I do this if I can't walk? Well, there's a thing called faith here <laughs> that, that comes into play. But he's put there every day to beg. Could Jesus have walked by him? Did Jesus walk by him? Did Jesus not bring him healing when he could? Because we know about the healings that Jesus did. We don't know about the healings that Jesus didn't do because Jesus knew that this day would come when he wanted greater things to be done through his people. And he's begging every day from those going in the temple courts. Let me paraphrase that differently from the church. Because there are people out there expecting the church to act and behave differently than someone else. Not to walk by on the other side of the road and say, <laughs> that guy's out here every day begging. You know, he's got enough. He's legitimate. He, he's been lame from birth. But that guy helped him over there. He doesn't need any more. I don't give him too much. Whatever your thought process is there. That's the way the world thinks. Verse 3. When he saw Peter and John, think about this. Hey, this is the two primary guys of the church. The priest that passed by on the other side and the Levite? <laughs> well, they're not going to pass by. They're going to look at him, okay? When he saw them about to enter, he asked them for what? Money. The people of the church were in awe because of the wonderful, mighty miracles that had been performed. But this guy said, I'll settle for money. How many times have we of ourselves done that? Well, God, I can't go on the foreign mission field. Now, that might be extravagant because I just don't have enough financial income to do it. Who's going who's gonna to take care of me? Whatever it is. He asked them for money. 
John 14, I want to remind you of that scripture, starting in verse 10. These are the words in red, given to the disciples when Jesus is spending his last day with them before their passion, the last evening. Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak of my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe in the evidence of the work themselves, the miracles. Verse 12, though. Very truly I tell you, truly, truly, listen up. If you have ears to hear, listen to this. Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. If you love me, keep my commands and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. Do you think Peter finally figured this out? I don't know about you, but I, I can't even fathom the kind of faith, even if I saw the guy there and, oh God, Lord, do a mighty miracle, would I have the faith to say, get up and walk? How did Peter know that? Except that he was in tune, in step, as Scripture tells us, with the Holy Spirit. Verse 4, Peter looked straight at him as did John. Remember how Jesus looked lovingly and taught his disciples. Then Peter said, look at us. Do we look like we have money we can give you? We already gave up everything. Do you know why we gave up everything? Wait a minute. Maybe I can't say that if I haven't gave, given up everything yet. Or at least if my heart's not willing to give up everything, I certainly can't say it. But Peter said, we've given up everything. But you know what we got in return? Jesus. And he's worth so much more than any money that you can think that will help you or anything else. <clears throat> so the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from them. Had he changed his thought process over of maybe there's something better than money? Or, or what was he thinking? Was he thinking a total miraculous cure? I don't know. I would be hard-pressed to think that way. If I'd been that way from life... I prayed, I did, even Paul prayed continually about his thorn in the flesh to be taken from him, but God, Jesus said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. Is Jesus' grace sufficient for you? The man gave him his attention, and Peter said, let me clarify this, silver or gold I do not have. I gave them up. I gave up everything to follow Jesus and fish for men. So I'm going to give you what I do have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And that statement was not to the people. That was not a good statement because nothing good comes out of Nazareth, remember? How could a prophet or anything else come from Nazareth? But he's making it clear. It's not just Jesus. It's Jesus of Nazareth. You've got to change your way of thinking. You think... Earthly, you think nothing good can happen, but I'm going to give you what Jesus gave me, the power to heal you. <clears throat> Taking him by the right hand. So Peter had to have a tremendous amount of faith and walk step and step with the Spirit. He helped him up. And when he did that, kind of like when the water tur turned to Ryan, Peter had faith and then he said, here's what happens, and then he took action upon it and a miracle happened. It didn't happen before that. It took all of that faith of us and action to do it. The prayer before it, the unity and power of the church behind it in prayer. And then he reached out and took him by the hand and helped him up. And instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong. Strong enough that he didn't have to learn to walk. That's a miracle on top of itself because he jumped to his feet and began to walk. <clears throat> Everyone was filled with awe. Do you remember that? Of all the miracles. We've read that in chapter 2. But here's a new miracle that Luke has to write down because this is so new, so exciting, so much faith. I already told you to mark verse 16. That this man, that Jesus himself may have walked past and have been lame since birth, is healed. Why? 
so that Peter could have a sermon experience, whatever you want to call it, that opportunity. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them in the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. You remember when Jesus came out the mount and the the man was there and said, I came to your, your disciples and asked them to cast out this demon from my son, and they couldn't do it. And why did Jesus tell them? He said, you faithless generation. And then they asked him afterwards, he said, why couldn't we cast him out? And he said, well, some require a lot of prayer. I guess that the church was doing this. I guess that they had the faith. I guess that they were praying because we see this happen here now. It's not a demon. It's, a, it's, it's an event just as cool. <laughs> I don't know what to say there. It took a lot of faith and a lot of action. And then he joined the church, praising God. He was expecting something from the church. He got more than he was ever expecting because he received Jesus. And then he became part of the church. Verse 9, when all the people saw this, the crowds, all of them, they saw him walking and praising God. He is now a witness. They recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. Luke doesn't write that he used to be the lame man. He says he used to sit begging because I don't like those guys begging all the time, especially as a professional beggar. And they were filled with wonder and amazement of what could happen to him. It's amazing to me that Luke writes that. They weren't amazed by the healing so much. They were amazed that he wasn't begging anymore. That's just crazy. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them at the place called Solomon's Colonnade. The purpose for this miracle was to proclaim the gospel of Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit does the work. Verse 12, when Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? You've read Scripture. You know enough about the Bible. You've heard the stories, and that's still true of people today. We do live in a country where people know about the Bible and know about Jesus. So we have an opportunity that's amazing there because at least it's not foreign to them. It'd be different if we were somewhere else and they hadn't heard about Jesus because then we could tell them about Jesus and they'd say, Oh, I was wondering His name. But here they're wondering if Jesus is true or not. And they're looking at you and I as a whole to see if our faith is genuine to see if our compassion and love is genuine or see if we'll turn up our nose and walk the other way and don't have the faith to help them, to truly help them. Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? It's nothing us. This is pointing to Jesus. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified His Son, Jesus. We take the emphasis off of ourselves and point it to the one that we love and adore and serve our king you handed him over to be killed you disowned him before Pilate though he had decided not to let he had decided not to let them go you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you you killed the author of life but God raised him from the dead boy that's a pretty harsh sermon I'd be kind of mad if you said I did all that I'm sure that many were but some were convicted We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know has been made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him as you all can see. This miracle happened so you can see it and now you have to decide if you're going to repent or not and believe. Verse 17, Now fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. That's a little bit more comforting. But this is how God fulfilled what He had foretold through all the prophets, saying that His Messiah would suffer and die. Would suffer. Repent then and turn to God. The same message. So that your sins may be wiped out. That times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And maybe you wonder what that means, and you maybe wonder, wonder what that means after I get through. But I think it's a continual thing again, that you're refreshed from the day of salvation, you're refreshed through your life being transformed into the image of Christ, and you will be refreshed for all eternity. If you're not seeing those days of refreshing, why not? 
Is it because you're sitting on your pity party? Is it because you're worried about what you're going to eat or wear? Is it because you, you don't think that you have the authority or the power to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ? Because the days of refreshing, the times of refreshing, will come from the Lord. And then, verse 20, that He may send the Messiah whom He has appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive Him until the time comes for God to restore everything. That's what we're working towards. This is now the church age. <clears throat> As He promised long ago through His holy prophets, for Moses said, The Lord God will raise up from you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything He tells you. That's what you should, should do, what you must do. And anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. It's black or white. And you're either gathering or you're scattering. Indeed, verse 24, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have sp spoken have foretold of these days. And think back what he said in chapter 2 about Joel prophesying of these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, Through your offspring, all people on earth will be blessed. So I have to sit down and ask myself, Am I a blessing to others? How many times have I walked by that guy, or whatever the situation is? Shame on me. <clears throat> when God raised up His servant, verse 26, He sent him first to you to bless you. I have been blessed, and am called to be a blessing to others. But he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Examine in me, O Lord. Do I have a clean heart? Is there anything keeping me? Is there any sins enticing me and entangling me? Am I being a blessing? Am I longing for the day that Jesus returns? Would I have walked by that guy? Would have I lacked the faith? Is my church behind me in, in the power of prayer united in the ministry? Or is there something we need to do a little differently? God will still save that man, and that's what we rely on so many times. If I, did, I don't do it, someone else, God will call someone else. But maybe He's calling you and I. And as we look at the days that's going on in this world, the opportunities will be there more and more and more. But will regulations or fear of disease stop us? And don't worry, we'll take whatever precautions we need in Iwanas. And Kim, you need to make sure you get some more hand sanitizers out everywhere. <laughs> and if we need to shut down, we'll shut down. But I can tell you this, if I'm the only one here, I'm going to be teaching these kids about Jesus because it's worth everything. It's the main ministry we have. Sherry and I went off on vacation, you know that. We had a pretty good time. It was nice relaxing with my wife and not worrying about anything. We really did get to go away and relax. But we both told each other the whole time, whether we were eating or sightseeing or laying by the pool, we said this repeatedly. You know, the most fun I've had in a long time was getting up here and leading the children in songs together. That's the most fun we've had. Together, telling children about Jesus and the treasure that they can have. I don't care where we went, what we di did, we would have said the same thing. And we've got faith that our children and our grandchildren and your children and your grandchildren will be saved if we act and live like Jesus. I can trust on His promises. I can fall into His arms no matter what happens, including COVID. If you read on Acts chapter 4, just as a teaser into next time, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees, those other religious people, they came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. <laughs> Didn't hesitate. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus what? Eternal life, resurrection of the dead. That's all you need to proclaim. The Bible says that Jesus is the way and truth and life. You need to believe it or not. But if you believe it, you will have eternal life. John 3, 16, what, whatever you need, just be willing and the Spirit will give you the words and have your heart focused on it. Let it be your, your mission. You're an ambassador living in a foreign world, giving the words of God as though He was making His reconciliation through you. 
They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So they did what? They seized Peter and John. Because it was evening, they put them into jail until the next day. Verse 4. But many who heard this message believed because of a miracle that took faith. Took faith on the part of the guy also. He had to have some faith. You read that enough in Scripture. He had to answer the call, that, you know, or if he didn't, which I think he did, God still used it. He still uses miracles through even those who don't believe. That's why, unfortunately, that day we'll hear, but Lord, we did many mighty miracles in your name. Because you're right, it's the name of Jesus, as Peter just said here. But see, on that day, Jesus says, depart from me, I don't know you. Well, the thing that tears me up so much about that verse is, the people that think they're saved that aren't. But it makes me self-examine myself again. If there are people out there doing mighty miracles, am I? Or do I lack the faith? Do I lack the attitude, the heart? The, the, am I letting things entangle me? Am I living for King Jesus? And you have to answer those questions yourself. But the number who believed grew to be about 5,000. You can't deny the facts. There were 3,000 on Pentecost. On day 347, is that what I said? However far, there were 2,000 more added during that time period up to this point. There's now 5,000 in the church. It's not about numbers, but it is about fishing for men and if you're forsaking all and following Jesus, then he'll catch them also. You can bank on those promises because it is God's will that all men be saved. And you're the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, that He will not forsake us, that He never will abandon us, that He has given us the authority and the power to do greater things than He has done. We thank You for these words of Luke and the transformation that we see in Peter's life and in John's life and the pattern that we set, see set for us of the, the people that believe. Lord, help us not to be entangled up in fear or... or enticements or anything else and Lord even when times are worse or even when times are good let us be thankful let us be focused on our mission and Father we do say a special prayer today for the school year for, the, for safety and health in our school systems that the children get to go and get education and, and coming together that they need and Lord, we pray for the Awanas program here, the Awanas program at our church away from us and all the other programs. And Lord, for those that are got out of the habit of meeting, even in our own denomination, and we know it's in other denominations, there are churches divided and there shouldn't be division. There are pastors retiring even in our own um, denomination and giving up. Lord, I just pray that we get focused on the mission before us and that we know no matter what happens that you work all things together for good and then Jesus Christ will return. We thank you and praise you in his name. Amen.